Hi everyone, welcome back. This will be, this is actually our last episode in uh, coming to know some plants. And I'm, I'm glad you're back. So we'll, we'll, we left off with Salvia Wiesui and Geranium Orion. And I just wanted to share uh, my book again with you. And also linked in the description below are some of my favorite books that you can find. And I'll keep adding books to that uh, in, in, in various episodes into that list. Because there's, there's, there's just a lot of good things to read, uh, especially now there's many more thoughts and um, goals and objectives in, in gardening, in environmental gardening. So uh, I'll try to list some of those for you. And I tell you, if you have any recommendations too, I'd sure like to know and, and hear what they are. I've got some good recommendations from people on Instagram. So uh, I think sharing with each other is, is a cool way to to, to, to really benefit each other. So let's see where we're at. I always, here's my two questions to discuss with you. Um, first one, what characteristics of each plant shape your personal experience with that plant? So what is it about a plant when you first see it or even witness or see it later? What characteristics of a plant creates your relationship for that plant where you actually, you create an interest for it? And, and is it the same with all plants? Or does each plant have its own way of introducing itself to you based on a unique characteristic of the plant? Because I, I always think about that when I uh, walk through gardens or when, I, when I'm visiting uh, remnant prairies or remnant woodlands or savannas, there's certain aspects of a plant, also based on growing season, the way it emerges out of the ground, that I really take an interest in. And sometimes I, might not have the same interest in the plant as it becomes an adult later. I, I, so I have to keep recreating myself to find out what, it, what is it about each plant that really continues to generate a shared relationship that I have with the plant. So anyway, that's, that's a, one question. The other one, is there a particular way you begin to sense a closeness to your plantings as they develop from youth to maturity? So is there a particular way that you can relate to a planting when it's youthful and as it ages? And again, I keep thinking about that when I'm gardening. When I, when I look at accomplishing and finishing a planting, first I'm just excited that, I'm, that it's done and it's in the ground because there's so many ways it, it, you know, it could be a rain or uh, something can come up that delays the planting and you have all the plants in containers. So when you're finished, that really feels good to me to have something complete. And then the, the anticipation of growth and then the expectations of weed competition. How heavy is the weed competition going to be? And did I anticipate what that would be based on the population of weeds that were there beforehand? So there's so many different ways that you come to grow with your garden. And I thought I'd, I'd, I'd ask that as a question because I constantly ask that to myself, and then when the garden does start to mature, how am I relating to it in a mature way as the plants are aging and becoming dynamic with each other? So anyway, that's the two questions to start with. And uh, well, here we go. I left with Salvia, and I start with uh, the show with Cecilaria autumnalis. And again, it's like, geez, Roy, we know Cecilaria autumnalis. And it, it, it's a common bunching grass, again, it, if you do know it, you know what the one characteristic, it loves dry soil, average dry soil. It does well in modestly moist soil, declines completely in heavily irrigated wet soil. Just can't handle that situation. But it's, it's such a stable plant for me to use because it accepts so many different plant patterns that I can mingle it with. I'm doing a garden now for a, a group on Pine Lake just north of us, and I'm mixing Cecilaria 60% are 40% Cecilaria with 60% Carex Pennsylvanica. And in between the groupings, I'm trying to come up with a combination or group of plants. I'm looking at, right now I'm thinking of Geranium Tiny Monster to mix as a mounding plant in between those two combinations. Because the Cecilaria and the Carex Pennsylvanica, 60% Carex, 40% Cecilaria, can go wonderfully into sun to shade. And so can the Geranium Tiny Monster and I'm not putting a lot of tiny monster in, I'm just putting one here, two here, one here, two here, just as a mounding growth habit 
with dark green to copper foliage. And I'm more interested in the dark green to copper foliage than I am in the dark purple flowers. So anyway, it's just an example of the value to me of Cesslaria in, in a number of different circumstances. And I also use Cesslaria with Sporobolus heterolepis in different percentages too. And here in the image, you can see it with, guess who? Calamintha nepeta subspecies nepeta. Again, the calamintha has so much value in combinations along with the, the Cesslaria. And here's Cesslaria, Jeff Epping, he's the director, head of horticulture at Oldbrook Botanic Garden. So get to know him. Go online, look up Oldbrook Botanic Garden, and get to know Jeff. When you go to Oldbrook Botanic Garden, this is just a little plug, you go, he, he designs gardens at Oldbrook with a wonderful staff. I mean, it, it's just not competent. These are excellent gardeners. And the gardens you see there is everything you can do at home. Some botanic gardens you go to, you can appreciate the, the, the grand scale of things, but there's a lot of things you just can't do at home because it's too expensive. You go to Oldbrook Botanic Garden, he's, he puts plants in the, like you can see here, these beautiful patterns. And everything at Oldbrook is something you can take home with you. That's Jeff, Jeff Epping. So yeah, take a look when you have time on, on the internet. So this is a combination, look at this beautiful combination, Cesslaria with the alliums with echinaceas and small acalias. It's just a beautiful combination. And it's a moment to moment feeling, but yet it has the consistency which is bonded together by the Cesslaria drifting through all the different combinations of flowering plants. And here's um, Cesslaria again, and simply with Coreopsis zagreb and geranium rosanum. So again, the Cesslaria is the bonding agent, the short Coreopsis zagreb, which gets around 20 inches tall, and geranium rosanum kind of scattering its flowering stems through the Cesslaria. The next grass I'd like to talk to you about is Schizacrium jazz. Jazz is an introduction again from Brent. Hovarth, I mentioned him in the last show, is Intrinsic Nursery out here in Hebron. And I like jazz a lot. It's a blue, it's blue, but it stays very vertical. It, it, gets, it gets taller, but not that tall, but it, it maintains its vertical, vertical look in heavier soils. It doesn't fall and lean over. And you can see in this image how nicely vertical it keeps itself going into flowering time. And the next image, I used it in the Fontana Boulevards with the uh, Krovskia Little Spire. And it mingles nicely in between the little spire. So it's a simple combination of grays and shades of grays and blue foliage with a little bit dappled blue of the Krovskia going through it. And there's the fall color. Again, very vertical, beautiful copper fall color. And, and I'll mention one other Schizacrium. I, I don't have an image of it, but it's a Schizacrium called Little Luke. I, I found a little Luke up in Ball Bluff in the Kettle Moraine. I simply liked it because it's only 18 inches tall. In our heavier soils, Little Luke gets around 24 inches tall, but it's green, it's not blue. And I know everybody's looking for the bluest blue. Well, what about the greenest green? Sometimes if you mix the greenest green with the bluest blue, you get more of a blue because you're contrasting the bluest blue with green. And Little Luke, being a very, I'd say rich to average, modest green, has a stronger fall color than the blue schizacrium. So when you mix the two together, you also get shades of copper and copper red and actually some purple in it. So again, that's why I like mingling some of the same species, but yet the ones that have different characteristics. So if you get a chance and you're around Northwind, come up and look at Schizacrium Little Luke and maybe uh, if you purchase a couple, mingle them together with the other Schizacriums. Um, the next plant uh, we'll look at in this image, this is Scularia incana. I didn't know this existed. I had no idea it's a native woodland plant grows on woodland edges. Pete Outolf sent it to me to grow for the Lurie Garden in 2003. And, again, and I said, geez, where'd you find that? He goes, Roy, it's native to your woodland areas in Minnesota. <laughs> So you can see how, how little, I, I didn't know, I just never heard of it. And it wasn't, no, it wasn't in any North American catalogs that I could find. And uh, now I, I grow it from seed and it's a beautiful plant. It, it loves full sun, the woodland edge, 
it spreads fast. It can, or modestly, but fairly fast. But again, you can stop it. Right here, I have it mixed with Molina Transparent. That Scutellaria hits Molina Transparent like this. There, it's not going anywhere. That Molina, crown of Molina Transparent says, no, nah, I got you. You're not going anywhere. So the Scutellaria, and it can't go this way because of the, of the, the walkway. So it maintains its own space simply by the dynamics of it into running into something that it can't penetrate. But it has beautiful blue flowers in August, uh, easy to grow. It has difficulty in, in wet soil. You can't plant it in wet soil. It grows in the average to dry, drier soil, shade to sun. So it goes from shade to sun. And here you see it with the uh, Coreopsis verticillata golden showers and Sparabolus uh, heterolepis. It's a dark, see that dark green foliage in this image? It's a beautiful plant. It's really, and it, I think again, it's waiting to be discovered and, and used in many more diverse ways. Next plant, uh, as you see this image come up, it's Silphium terebinthinaceum. This is the first time I ever saw it. You see in this image, I saw it at the Morton Arboretum at the Schulenberg Prairie, and it's coming up in between uh, um, Panicum virgatum and some Sorgastrum newtons. And I'm seeing these giant leaves coming out of the ground. And I had no idea what this was. I didn't know if this was a good plant, but what humans characterize, good or bad, I don't. But I thought, my God, that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And this is the picture I took, because I had to find out what in the heck is this plant coming with this foliage? And then when I felt the foliage, and I did that, I'm an outdoor ed teacher, I touch everything. You know, I we used to have kids, I'd put a bunch of stuff in a box, put the lid on the box, cut a hole, and I said, Come here, stick your hand in that box, tell me what you feel. Nine out, of ten, nine out of 10 urban kids would not stick their hand in that box. I go to a rural community when we were at Western Illinois, every kid in the world is sticking their hand in that box. They wanted to feel everything in that box. And for some reason, urban kids, eh, they don't wanna, they don't wanna do that. Tell me what's in the box first, then I'll stick my hand in the box. That's a sidetrack. Anyway, my curiosity of touch was there and it's such, it, it felt like sandpaper, green sandpaper. I was very intrigued by this plant. And then when I met Ray Schulenberg, he goes, Roy, that's Silphium terebinthinaceum, and here's all the other things it does. So Ray, in this magical way, was describing its fall colors. Its second, I'm just listening, and I, I couldn't comprehend all the beautiful things he was telling me because I, I needed to see what he was saying. He was so excited that somebody asked him about it. And then I actually walked all the way over to that prairie to even take a look at it. But anyway, it's a beautiful architectural plant. And here I've used it at the Art Institute, next image. Oh, and I, huh, guess who it's with? Calamintha nepeta subspecies nepeta and Schizacrium scoparium. But look at the contrasting foliage. And you, you probably are familiar with the flowering stems getting six and a half feet tall. And they come up, you got beautiful yellow, more yellow than orange flowers at the top. It's uh, kind of like a sunflower. And then as they, as they open, they fall over like this. And I'm always disappointed when I see silphium in someone's backyard, not because they have silphium, because they have the urge to take a bamboo stick, put it next to the flowering stem that is artistically arching over and tie it up straight. And I thought, boy, that's so bad. I'm not bad, I guess it's sad in a way that people have this belief that everything has to be controlled. So the beauty of it is not controlling the plant. The beauty of it is appreciating the plant's nature and planting something where if that leans and it leans through uh, the little blue stem coming through it, it's just a beautiful artistic look. So Silphium terebinthinaceum prairie dock, an exciting plant. And sometimes, and I have to admit doing this, the flowering stems are a distraction in a garden. In, some, in one of the gardens, that I just cut them off. So I'm confessing something probably not good that you don't want to hear. That son of a gun cuts off the flowering stems. He's just telling us not to stake them. But in a certain particular site, the flowering stems just got too big. But I really was looking and appreciating that beautiful foliage, especially in the fall. Here's an image right now of the fall foliage. It looks, uh, one, Chris today, I was just talking to, his children describe it as a brown seashell that they'd find along the ocean. And you can see the way it curls together. 
And again, the first place I saw this in 1979 was at the, the library at the Morton Arboretum. It had grasses in a vase and had these sylphium foliage with beautiful seed heads of panicum. And it was through the library at the Morton Arboretum. I didn't know what it was, but I thought, boy, that is beautiful. The next, the next picture that you're looking at really has nothing to do with anything you're ever gonna do except observation. And I found this picture of an old fence and had 15 species of lichens on this fence living happily together. And I didn't know that Jerry Wilhelm sat there with a little hand lens identifying and telling me the name of each lichen on this fence. I didn't remember any of them. But here I was so excited to see Jerry on the ground with a little hand lens identifying King on all these lichens. Jerry's writing a book on our native lichens and the idea was they were putting a power line through this particular area on a, it's a children's fishing park. So I said, well, I'll just take the fence down, move it, and I'll bring it back when the power line and do the trend. Jerry goes, no, Roy, you can't move this. All these lichens will die. You have to keep the fence and move it and keep it right where it is, as little as you can. Every lichen on this fence has grown in this particular situation. So you can't take the fence back to Northwind and lean it in the barn for two weeks and bring it back there, the lichens will suffer. And I thought, you know, that is like the nicest thing I've ever heard. So what we did, we just moved the fence in place, um, working with the trenching people. I hardly moved it at all, but we did move it so they could put the trench through. But I thought it was, in my world, it was just simply take it back to the farm and put it back in. So I thought it's just something something different to notice when, we, when we're out walking through fields and woods. Is, um, and I, I have to say, I just started noticing it. I've always seen lichens, but I've never really paid attention to them closely until, uh, until I saw Jerry naming them and looking at them with a hand lens, and it just moved me so much. So I wanted to share that and that little story with you. And, uh, Anyway, that, the next image is Parabolus heterolepis, prairie drop seed. You all know prairie drop seed. Most of you, you've all planted it. Uh, it gained popularity through the 90s, more horticulturally. It was used a lot in prairie recreation and restoration, uh, but now it, it's uh, more commercially used. But it's, it's just a very nice soft textured grass, very adaptable from wet to dry conditions. And it supports so many different combinations of plantings. Here you see it in this image with allium purple sensation. And simply the sprobilis hides the lower foliage of the allium purple sensation. And so each plant in this image is complementing the other. And that's basically what a, a good plant community does, is one plant promoting the health of the other plant by the living and dying of its leaf fall and stem fall, and also the living and dying of its roots. And then for human entertainment, it's one plant complementing, complementing the other plant based on the soft texture of the grass and the dark flowering stems and the flowers of the allium. And that gives some joy and entertainment to humans. So you have a good system of health right here, lifting the spirit of a human and each plant helping the other plant live a healthy life based on the nutritional and energy building of the soil. And here's Sprobilus heterolepis with Allium Summer Beauty at a, a resort entrance I did in, in bloom. It has that beautiful soft texture in bloom. And here's Allium, uh, uh, Sprobilus heterolepis in bloom with Stachys humulo, the brown seed heads of Stachys humulo coming through as the Sprobilus arches over, over the Stachys. So basically in these three pictures, I was, I'm, I'm just trying to show the excitement of Sprobilus just in three different images using three or four different plants. And it was back to what I mentioned before, the possibilities are endless, really. There's no, there's no stopping. There's no stopping the combinations we can come up with. The next plant is Stachys officinalis humulo. I've been growing this now probably since the mid, mid 90s. And I used to grow Stachys officinalis from seed and I still grow it from seed because it varies in height. It doesn't stay uniform like Officinalis humulo. But you can see in the two images, there's Stachys Officinalis humulo. And who is it with? It's with Sparabilis heterolepis. And 
the percentage wise, it's about 50-50 or 60-40 stakies. And I put more stakies in or an equal amount because the Sparablo's foliage gets so big. And as it matures, it sends out foliage almost 12, 12 to 14 inches in each direction of the crown. And then, then the other image is Stachys Umolo with Stachys officinalis rosea. So you can have your Monet moment. You can put different percentages of colors together, soft pink at 50 to 60% or 30%. You do whatever you feel like, whatever your mood is. But the two plants live well together because they have the same, basically the same needs as far as care in the garden. And here's Stachys Umolo with geranium sanguinium uh, striatum and, and uh, uh, Nepeta, it's not Walker's Low, it's that new Nepeta. I can't, it's, it's a low, it's a, I'll get it. I'm sorry, I don't remember right now. It's a new Nepeta that came out like Walker's Low, but it's not Walker's Low. It's, a, it's actually very nice, it's vertical. And I'll get that to you, I just can't remember the name of it. And here's Nepeta, I mean, here's Coreopsa verticillata golden showers with Stachys umolo. And this is a simple planting at a gas station. And I, I was so impressed when I pulled in there, and I was so excited that the woman who owns the gas station found such a beautiful combination. And it filled the whole planter that she had in the gas station, and then she mingled in some annuals with it. And I thought, oh my God, this is a beautiful Monet moment that she created. And you can see how the Coreopsis and the Stachys Umolo mingle together. And the beautiful seed heads of Stachys Umolo, they go from green, they go from the flowers, the flowers fade. You have the green seed heads mixed with geranium Orion that I mentioned earlier with the salvia. And see how Orion just softly mingles and lays its way into the vertical flowering stems. And then the brown, the brown seed heads of Stachys Umolo, they go from green to brown, mingled in with the uh, Allium Millennium. And in this next image, the darker brown of Stachys Umolo with Aerograssus spectabilis weaving its way through Perovskia little spire. So you have the beautiful clouds of Aerograssus spectabilis mingled in with the spacing of the Perovskia and fronted by Stachys officinalis Umolo. The next plant is a grass that's not very common. It's Sparablus aeroides. I got the seed from someone in Idaho. Sparablus aeroides uh, grows in, it's, I think it's native to Idaho, Utah, but it's done very well in our heavy clay soils, so I really enjoy growing it. It has silvery green foliage. The foliage is more lax than Sparablus heterolepis. It's a little wider. But the cool thing about Sparablus aeroides, it blooms in mid to late June with clouds of panicles. And you can see it with the uh, Echinacea alba. And then it reblooms in September. So as the first flowers fade to brown and still maintain a nice habit, it sends a rebloom of silvery flowers through it in September. And again, it, it has done very well in our heavier soils. So I'm using it more and, and more, and I have not seen, I'm not seen, I've not lost it through the winter yet. And that doesn't mean there won't be a winter that comes along, but I've been using it now for five or six years, and I don't put a lot in. It, it really works well for me as an accent in the garden. Three over here, two over here, four over here, and then I have other grasses, more tight clumping grasses like Cesslaria that I would mingle in to keep a vertical look. And it, I don't use many millennias with it because the flower, the arching flowers have similar characteristics. And when I mingled that in, it, there, there wasn't enough distinction between one or the other. So that's Sparablus aeroides. I would give it a try. I think, I think you'll enjoy it. And again, I have had good luck with it now for four or five years. This next grouping is Vernonia iron butterfly, which I start, I've been using now for five or six years. It's a short-growing Vernonia lettermanii. And there's a lot of new selections out right now um, that are a little bit taller of the Vernonia hybridized hybridize with the lettermanii genetics. And this is mixed with Solidago Golden Fleece. I like Solidago Golden Fleece a lot 
stays in clumps. It doesn't reseed anywhere. It's a solid eagle, and there's very few of them that respect their space. So I use solid eagle golden fleece right away. I have no problem with it. It doesn't seed around. It doesn't spread by rhizomes. And look how nice it mingles with Vernonia lettermanii, which is also a clumping plant that I have not seen reseed or spread itself around either. So it's a very controlled plant grouping plant community. And another plant I discovered, uh, Bluebird had it. It's an, and I, it's curious, they still haven't given it a species. It's called Solid Eagle Wichita Mountain. And discussing it with them, it comes from the Wichita Mountain area and there's not a species associated with it, but I like its vertical spikes of flowers, similar to one we have called Solid Eagle Speciosa. But if, when I use Solid Eagle Speciosa, it's like buckle up. The Solid Eagle Speciosa, if you put it in early, it seeds everywhere. So I have not used Solid Eagle Speciosa. Again, when the garden is three to five years old, I can put it in, and I still don't use a lot, I just use it in accent. I want to discover Wichita Mountain. I had that same vertical accent with the spikes. Solid Eagle Wichita Mountain, I haven't seen it seed anywhere in the garden. So now I have two, two go-to golden rods that I can use early in the garden's life, and that's Wichita Mountain and Golden Fleece. So if you have an opportunity, I know Bluebird has it in liners and also Stonehouse Nursery. You ought to get Stonehouse Nursery's catalog. They have an excellent variety of small liners. I believe they're only wholesale, but you can get their catalog and maybe recommend your local, your local nursery, look at some of their plants and pot them up for you. They're, they're an excellent nursery in Michigan, that's Stonehouse Nursery. We're getting to the last plant, and there's always that say, save the best for last, but I haven't done that because I think I've been describing the best best to you. But it's Veronicastrum virginicum. It's a beautiful native plant. I think the common name is Culver's root. And I can't help but use this as frequently as I can. It has a beautiful upright growth habit. It, it leans so nicely unintentionally, it just happens to lean based on the soil conditions I put it in. It's not a big fan of drought, it's average to moist soil, but I, I like, I really enjoy the way and the time it flowers also. Here it is with uh, Calmagrastus uh, Carl Forster and Eupatorium Baby Joe is in the garden with it, but it's an easy plant to grow. It has beautiful spike flowers. And again, it has this, it has its own nature of leaning and it seems to lean at just the right time and into the right group of plants. And I wanna end this, this last episode, our third one, with the Dutch push pull hole. I wanted to remind you of it, who probably haven't heard me talk about it or say, so you can see here how we use it in the garden. Again, it's 72 inches tall. And if you notice, she's not bending over. She's doing all her hoeing standing upright. And again, if you haven't heard me mention this, we hoe about 75 to 85 minutes per thousand square feet. And we have hoeing windows going from late April. And we do every two weeks into mid to late June before the garden tightens up. And once the garden tightens up, it's very difficult to get in there with the Dutch push pull hoe because the plants are now taking on more responsibility of limiting uh, weed seed germination. So it's this cooperative effort between you, the gardener, and the plants you've placed in the garden. So. I hope you've enjoyed these few talks we've had about coming to know some plants. And our, our next YouTubes we'll be doing, we'll have more coming to know plants, but we'll be looking at combinations. We'll be looking at, again, refining a little bit how to develop these combinations. So I'll have grid paper here, and I'll again go through the thought process of putting the plants together in, in systems and communities. and. Again, if you have questions, please uh, let me know and I'll do my best, especially in the winter, to get back to you with, with, some, with some answers that I'd have. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. See you later. Bye.